What lecture number is this? Was the question. This is uh, number four in this series, but it's probably the tenth overall. And that's actually a nice question. Thanks for setting that up so well for me, Eric, because uh, I'm going to reference today a couple of other pieces. They're, they're actually webinars that we put out previously that are available on our YouTube that will touch on some of this. So we've already done an entire lecture on the customer journey. We're going to use it as a framework today, but if you want to learn more about that, there is a YouTube video with the same kind of slides. There's slide share, same stuff that's out there on these others. But this is the fourth in the Dawn of the Data Age lecture series, and they're slightly different. And the table is shifting because I, I broke it. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me today. For those who don't know me, I'm Luciano. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Imperitas. We're a team of economists and data scientists who focus a lot on customer lifetime value. I'm also the director of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah, where I teach applied research and data analytics, among other econ courses. And I also teach data science for Westminster and created their MBA emphasis in data science. So I will bring my experience in both of those things to our presentation, our lecture today. There are three portions. I think so far we've been able to get through these in about 45 minutes to an hour. We do notice drop off at about 45 minutes, so that's gonna be my, my goal here. <clears throat> the first piece is to teach you how to use analytics to answer business questions, and this is tied to one of the previous lectures that we did about making sure you have a, a goal already in mind before you just go hunting in the data. The second is to explain best practices when visualizing complex data. This is really important. If, if you're an analytical person, this is one of the most important things that I think as a skill you on average are lacking. I think, I don't think it's a matter of math brain versus creative brain. I think it's a matter of how you were actually taught and encouraged to use data analytics and to report things like p-values and table output that just doesn't make sense to anybody that's not heavily, heavily educated in statistics. And so they just tune out. And that's a big part of making what you actually are producing usable to the team is they have to understand it if they're then, and this is the third part, going to go and use it. So how do you present this to them? How do you take complex data output, not just descriptives like we covered in the last lecture, but really complex, I'll show you a regression model today. You can't put a regression model up in front of decision makers and hope that they're going to understand and then internalize and then go act on it. You have to do that part of the legwork for them. So the last lecture left off, we had, we had finished doing some descriptives, but even before that, the lecture previous, we had laid out the smart data goal system. This is just one of many ways to organize a data project. That was the getting to quick wins with data lecture. And it, it is very specific. Do this step, then do this step. Here's a document to mirror, then go do this thing. And it's laid out that clearly because it's one very effective system. There are others. The point is use a system. If you are sitting now, if you are sitting down after running all of this complex analytics, after doing all this descriptive statistics and, and data mining that you've been working on, and you don't have a business question to answer, then the chances that whatever you present will be meaningful and then be acted on are pretty low. You should have already had the goal in mind. That's why we have the, the smart data goal system is it forces you to lay out what I need to know, what data I'm going to use to get it, what's a measurable success, what will be done with it once that information is delivered, and how soon is it needed. And that's a spreadsheet. You have to get to the point where you can fill in a spreadsheet. And so it's very easy for you to go look at that spreadsheet and say, Tom had this question. It's right here. It's one of the rows in our smart goal sheet. And so I'm going to make a slide with this as the title. Tom, here's your answer to this question. That makes assembling all the stuff you've done extremely easy. So if you've taken that time at the beginning of the project to set the goal, it shouldn't be very hard for you to then tie this back to it. Another really great way to turn analytics into insights to people, and keep in mind, insights is a different word. I know that it's become sort of a, the next jargon sort of big data word, 
everything's an insight, but there is actually a very fundamental difference. Analytics is the, is can be many, many different types and processes, and uh, it could be one visual, it could be a hundred visuals. That's not the insight. The insight is what did all of that mean, and then how does that answer Tom's first question? That's the difference between analytics and an insight. And so this bridge of getting to making those insights also actionable is using frameworks. This forces you, analysts are notorious for getting tunnel vision. And if you've never caught yourself in Excel or R or Python at four in the morning and asking yourself, where did seven hours go after you've been chasing some data point down a rabbit hole of everything it's connected to, that's tunnel vision. And then it's very hard for you as an analyst who's gone through that process to understand, to put yourself in the perspective of someone who has no idea what this data is, doesn't know the background of the project, may have been there at the beginning to set the goals, maybe not. Even if they were there to begin with, they might not remember them. That was whatever, four months ago, three months ago, two months ago for them. You take for granted how deep the knowledge you have is as an analyst. And so if you use a framework, it forces you to take everything you know and put it into something simple that someone else can understand. So just like having a system for your goals is important, now having a system for, a, for laying out a story with your analytics is necessary. The most effective frameworks that we have found, and I'd love to know if you have other frameworks that you think are useful, I would love you to share those with me. But the three that we have found touch on all parts of the business they're things that people can quickly understand and grasp. They're things people are actively searching for now. Here are the three best. The customer lifetime value, which is the focus of next month's entire lecture, how to calculate it. That's a really clear metric, and it touches on all the revenue that comes in. It touches on non-monetary things that the customer brings. And it's really easy for people anywhere in the organization, from marketing to sales to customer management experience to leadership, it is almost immediately uh, expressed what it is just in its title. So it's a really great framework, and you'll find that most of the data that you end up working with touches on some part of it. The second are customer personas. This became really popular within the development community, and it's really spread to marketing. Putting a real face on groups so that you can relate to them in a human term and not in a data analyst jockey term or as a manager. You have a real target that you're understanding. So you have to create those and we're going to talk about that in this lecture. It's one of the frameworks I'll present with. And then the third is the customer journey mapping and this is to answer your question, Eric. There is a YouTube video and there is a slide share of the presentation slides called Hacking Your Customer Journey where that process is laid out. And it actually goes in reverse from what we're going to do today. It starts with purchase, which is sort of what we're going to do when we look at this persona, because we already have their customer lifetime value, but then it worked back to the consideration phase, which we're not even talking about today, back to the awareness phase, which we are talking about. And what's the channel mix? What's the messaging? What product and pricing is working? What do competitors do? That's a really good framework because, again, it, it helps sales, it helps marketing, it helps product development, it forces you to put your data into an order and your analytics into a framework that people then can quickly understand. But I'd say the hardest, maybe not the, the hardest, maybe the second hardest, I think the hardest part is actually explaining it in simple terms, but the, a step to that and definitely the close second in difficulty is visualizing data output. It's not always easy to translate, especially as you get into more cl complex modeling you start to do things with regression analysis, um, they don't know what adjusted R squared is. No one else in the order, and even people who've been trained in stats, will often not fully understand what adjusted R squared is. And that's not even really what you're focusing on, because you're not publishing a paper. Either your model is predictive or it's not. Either your data is correct or it's not. You're going to have to test, iterate, test, iterate, test, iterate. That's the real scientific method. But focusing on things like model fit does not help them understand the message of the data, the information that's behind the data, that's behind the insight. I actually think that data science and people who like data are t 
typically on average more creative than most other people. In fact, most of my top data friends that I would that I can think of off the top of my head have other creative fields. Some do music, one does pottery. They're pretty creative people. But they don't ever use it when they're using data, which is weird. It's always a hobby or some side project. You need to tell a story to people with this data. You can't just hit them with chart after chart after chart, mean after median after skew after all these measures of difference. You can't do it. They won't follow you. You need to do these first two steps on your own, thinking broadly. These are uh, core principles in Imperatos, by the way. This is one of our core values. Thinking broadly, capture all the relevant information and data. That's the context. That's what we talked about last time, making sure you understand the context of the data. Mining deeply. We started to go through some of that last time, but really the predictive model that we're going to show today is that, is mining deeply. And then translating it into very plain spoken terms. I'm using the term English because I'm assuming everybody that's on this call is an English speaker. It is whatever vocal, verbal language you use is the point. How would you actually explain it in words? That's what should be in your reports, not, not the complex stuff. And that last part is very difficult, explaining simply. But I think that data people have this ability to tell a good story if they have those frameworks. Simple is always better. Always better. If you can do it in 10 words instead of 15 words, that is better, as long as you lose no truth. Really avoid statsy jargon. When I was saying R squared, um, that's one, one sort of statsy term that people like to use. I would never put a p-value in any of these deliverables. If someone asks you if it's relate, reliable, you should have been testing at a confidence interval that you feel comfortable with. If they want to know what that is, tell them. But putting p-values and asterisks on things does not mean anything to most people who are consuming this. And brevity is best. If you can't explain this to an eight-year-old, then the output is too complicated. Test it. Give yourself, put together your report, and I'll show you, we're gonna go through an example, work example of doing that. Sit on it for a little bit, don't wait till the last minute, so that you have this ability to sit on it, go try to explain it and show it to someone around the age of eight. If they don't, if they can't grasp what's going on in broad details, it's still too complicated. And then go back when you think it's all done, and look for every single word or thing that does not need to be there and cut them out. There's a, the mathematician Pascal in one of his letters apologized to the person and said, this letter is long because I didn't have time to shorten it. Leave time at the end to make that additional step. And use visuals. Two out of three people, including the people on your team, so just by averages, the people on your team the majority are going to be visual learners. And all people, whether they're a visual learner or not, can process visuals far, far faster than they can text. This, this came up in the, uh, the first of this lecture series, just how fast people can process visual information. It does not have to be complex charts. It can be visuals, images. If you're saying red line, you can put a red line visual on that page because what will happen is if the title is clear and the visual supports it, you are priming them for the information. And then you're not overwhelming them with too much. A lot of the visuals, uh, we went through a lot of the best practices in visualization in the Interpreting Data Like a Pro lecture last month. That one's also on YouTube right now and the slides are on SlideShare. That has the, specifically, how do you handle a nominal variable, an interval variable, a ratio variable, how are we going to do uh, different counts, percentages, Why are, what's the five number summary? I would encourage you to have all of that ready but not necessarily put it into the deliverable. It's going to depend on your audience. If you have a really savvy audience, then by all means, throw in data, throw in visuals, make sure they're correct, make sure your axes are labeled, make sure the scales are clear, make sure the title is clear. You've got a legend you should have that stuff ready anyways. That was the point of that last lecture. That was the hunting you did to get to the, to the moment where you could build a predictive model. So you should have all of that information. You don't have to stuff it into the final report. 
In fact, if it's not a te if it's not a very savvy audience, I would say avoid almost all charts and just hit on the conclusions. That's what the insight is. And you'll see an example of that in a moment. But knowing the audience's advice everybody gets when they do public speaking, and it's true, whatever, whatever deliverable you're going to give, there is an audience for it. It might be something you present in person. It might be something you hand off to a manager. The audience might also be people in the organization down the road who weren't there to begin with. How do you take very complex analytics and all the tunnel vision that, you've, that you are suffering from since you've dug so deeply into all of this data and now put it into a form that anybody could understand? People discount ugly stuff. It's a sad, sad reality of the world. There's huge economic gains to being beautiful in, in life measurable economic gains. People at 60,000 times the speed of a written word or a spoken word will visually look at something and say, is this quality or not? And if it's not, then they start to question it. It is probably the most controllable thing within your power when you're translating analytics into insights is to make sure that it is a quality deliverable. If it's a presentation, it's a quality presentation. It's supported by visuals. You are clear, you're on point, you rehearsed it. You recorded it so somebody who wasn't there could watch it. If it's a, a written report, it's free of errors. It's simple language. It doesn't use excessive words. Charts are clear. <clears throat> There's white space. Quality signals, and people pick up on signals quick, very fast whether or not what you're presenting is reliable. You remove this as a barrier and they won't, by default, start to question the results, at least not because of something arbitrary like the quality of the visual. So put that time into making sure that it's, it's clean. Be very explicit. This is what I said about the goal sheet with Tom. Tom wanted to know this. There it is, it's in the sheet, we can point to it. Tom said he was gonna use it this way. And he said he needed it by this point for it to be useful. And he also said that if I did what I'm going to show you I'm doing right now with this data, that it would be considered and measured as a win. Tie what you are presenting directly to one of those. Hey, this section, there's five slides. Or the, for the next five minutes, I'm going to talk about this specific unknown that we had as a company. And part of what I'm going to say in it is, here's how we're going to use it. One of the things that kills data projects, and I said this in some of the past lectures, about 80% of data projects ultimately fail. They don't really meet the end goal, the stated goal that people were hoping. A, a good portion of it is just because of human turnover. Maternity leave, paternity leave, deaths. That shouldn't stop a project. That shouldn't limit actionability from all the analytics work that you've done. Stuff's got to be built to outlive you and that one deliverable. So again, if it's a presentation, record it. Record the audio only if necessary and have a redundancy. Two is one, one is none. Your recording will likely fail if you only have one device. If it's a report, make sure that it's available to everybody in one place. Google Drive is awesome for that. Box is awesome for that. There's plenty of solutions to put this up. SlideShare, you're able to go get any of these lectures on YouTube or SlideShare. There are places where people can go and see it and consume it. And that's because they're not going to, people in the future or other people in the organization who might come along probably won't have you there to explain it. And this is a good test of whether or not you've broken the tunnel vision. Could someone who had no connection to it look through this and say, yeah, this is what I got from it. It's something you can test, by the way. But beyond the actual deliverables, they should also, your team should also have access to replicate and reference. So original data files, a survey. We're going to talk about survey data today, so a copy of the survey. Oh, we got a question. A 
Okay, so we got a question about segments and personas, and we're, we're about to get to them, so I'm going to punt that for a moment. But putting together a deliverables folder where the report, the recording of the report, the slides, the data files, the raw data file, the clean data file, your scripts, or a write-up about what you did, if other people can't replicate it or reference it, it's not going to survive you. And I don't know if people do this because they're worried they made a mistake, which is the wrong thing because you should make this open. You should pay people to find mistakes in your work. They will. If you actually incentivize them, people will, hey, here's a flaw, here's a problem. That makes the insight more accurate, and that should be your ultimate goal. Replication and reference are a standard for the, the very end about whether or not this will be actionable. And always make recommendations. This is, this is one of the hardest things to convince really good data people about is that they should make recommendations. And that's because if you go back to statistics books, or you go to old market research books, they're going to say, you as the analyst, your role is to take an arm's length approach to this problem. You shouldn't make the recommendations. You should just say, Tom, here is your answer this is the data, but that's it. That's all the data says. And I'll admit, for the first few years that I was a practicing applied researcher and data scientist, I, I did that. And every single time, someone would say, well, what do you think this means? What do you think we should do? And for the first while, it was like, uh, I, I don't think you should ask me that question. I don't know how to answer it. And then for sure, whatever I did say after that, they weren't going to believe because it was like, well, if, you don't, if you're not confident in your recommendation, I'm not going to take it. The point is they really wanted it because, again, they don't understand all of this. It's part of your job, if you want, I should say, if you want to get from analytics to actionable insights, then it is part of the job to synthesize and then make recommendations. In fact, it's the ultimate benchmark about whether you've really synthesized something. Can you make a clear recommendation for action? That's also why the goal sheet says in there, here's what the action will be. It's predetermined. We're going to change marketing. Okay, well, what's your recommendation? Well, I think we should do Facebook and email oh, and the website over brochures based on what I saw in all this data. And it's right there, a clear recommendation. They do not have to take it. But they're going to ask, so you should be prepared for one. And nobody's better suited than you, having spent all this time in the data, to actually make that recommendation. OK, so those are the best practices, best ways to visualize storytelling with data. The rest of this time, I want to walk through a work example. Feel free to jump in with questions, again, through the chat, or you can just unmute yourself. Um, this continues on directly from what we did last month. So if you go to last month's lecture, you can see the first half of this very customer lifetime value work example using the same data set, using the same business problem. We try to create some continuity between these two months. So the business goal, again, we're going to tie it right back, right from the beginning. What were we supposed to do? <clears throat> The goal sheet had a row. That row said this. The festival needs to learn what drives their customer lifetime value and how to increase it to drive more profit. So not just what's behind customer lifetime value, but how to increase it profitably. They said, we will change marketing targets, we will change marketing spend, and we will change the marketing channel mix based on this information, if we can get it before the next season, they have a lag. The data in the goal sheet that was going to be used was from two sources. The vast majority of it is from survey. This was a Qualtrics survey. Uh, 70,000 people were solicited. There were more than 4,000 surveys that were completed, but after data cleaning, looking for people who sped through the survey, straight line, gave garbled information in open-ended text boxes, came from the same IP address or same, you know, ways we could tell they were clearly duplicated. Um, after that cleaning, we had 3,800 cross-sectional responses on a very large survey 
for their customer base. This also included observational data on their lifetime ticket purchases. So if you're purchasing tickets by email, then they can easily within their ticketing system get a cumulative lifetime ticket sales and that became a metric that we used. One of the really nice features about Qualtrics is the embedded data fields. If you have observational data like this ahead of time, then you can upload it with your contact list. You can then tell the survey, embed this data field in the data output, and there's no chance unless the Qualtrics machines fail, and machines occasionally fail, but I've never seen this problem with Qualtrics. There's no chance that you're not going to correctly one for one associate through the email their actual lifetime value to their survey responses. Now you wait to do that later in Excel and you introduce the opportunity for human error. So knowing that, we took these two data sources, merged them through Qualtrics, downloaded that, cleaned it out, and this is the data that we're gonna to use to answer that very specific question, let's go back to it. What's driving customer lifetime value, specifically and in a profitable way, and then how are we gonna be able to change this marketing? If you go back, oh, you got a question? Um, were you concerned about that you had a 5% of the sample and that that was good enough to represent the 95%? Yeah, the power of all the tests is very, very high because of the number of responses. And I'll say this, we also did some qualitative work where we went, this is real data, and I, I hope I haven't slipped up and said who this is because I'm trying to keep the anonymity. Um, I think they'll forgive me if I do make a mistake though, but we went and we actually observed this festival. We did qualitative work. We went ahead, we saw, we followed people around, did shadow interviews. Um, we got to know the customer base pretty well and it matched, the data that we got matches perfectly with what we saw. So there's that, val that additional validation. There were, there was other past surveys that they had done in previous years, but often spaced out quite a long time ago, so maybe a decade before and two decades before. This is a very old festival. And it matched pretty consistently with that as well. And so this is definitely one of the dangers of using a sample. When we talked about data types in that last lecture, um, sample data has this issue. You could just get a random sample that happens to just be all the high customer lifetime value people. And the people who are actually low customer lifetime value maybe wouldn't have even taken the survey. But we also knew the customer lifetime value from observational ticket data it didn't come from the survey. We were validating with some survey questions as well. So I'm very confident in this as a sample and you don't really wanna go above 10% ever anyways. So there's a reason within probability that you don't wanna go and it's beyond the scope so we'll probably push on here in a moment. But, um, but there's a reason when you sample without replacement, meaning you're not gonna just hit every one of their customers over and over and over with a survey. And after they take it, you're gonna hit them again and take it again. That's, that's sampling with replacement. That's not how almost any sampling and survey research works. What you do is you get a group and you email them maybe once or twice or you solicit them on social media or you do other things, you text message them. And once they've completed it, you leave them alone. In fact, that's one of the benefits of using the contacts or what they used to call the panel feature in Qualtrics is that you can upload that list of emails that allows you to link the customer lifetime value data to the survey one for one. You can put their name in there so you can also customize the survey, which is a really nice feature, but you can say, send Tom this unique link. And once Tom clicks it and his IP is on that, he, that link can't be shared with Eric, who then takes the survey as well, and then we can't tell if it was Tom or Eric who took it. So it actually increases the response, the respondent control for the survey, for the survey uh, environment. That also helps a lot with ensuring the quality of, of the data. Okay? So this is stuff that we learned from that previous descriptive hunting we did, that most, most festival, and keep in mind, this is the average. So I'm giving you this story now of this is the big picture. This is all of our festival attendees. All right? They've been attending for less than 10 years, the majority of them. But there is a small group that's been coming for more than 20. That's going to become important in a moment. 
Festival customers are unlikely to come alone. They only buy tickets. We saw the multimodality in that last visual last time. They only buy tickets in pairs, and it's usually about four tickets. And the net promoter score is extremely high. I think it's above 90. Um, most of these people are likely to recommend the festival. The average customer lifetime value that we found last time after we trimmed out that outlier that we discovered who had a customer lifetime value of more than $500,000 or one person. And it was a real it was a real data observation, yeah. You talk about outliers, it was 55 standard deviations above the mean. Keeping in mind that an outlier definition is two to three, depending on how strict you want to be. And so we saw that in the observational data, and we said if that was a survey response, we would have just immediately thrown it out, right? We would have said there's no chance. Somebody meant they spent $585, and we're going to toss out this outlier. But this is observational data on the actual ticket sales. So then we had to go back to IT and make sure that they had pulled it correctly. And then we had to check the ticket software system. And it was valid. And then one of the things that we used to cross-validate it was the open-ended response on the survey talked about who they were. And it was a large organization who buys huge amounts of tickets and brings children from out of state to this festival. And there's all these social components. It's nonprofit related. They're not a typical customer. So yes, it's a valid data point, but we need to drop it. The customer lifetime value went, uh, we'd have to go look at it. I can't off the top of my head remember. I think it dropped from 1,200 to 486 or something. Once that one, keep in mind, there's 3,700, 999 other people in this data, and that leverage from that one data point was just big enough to skew it. So we did some trim work, and that's outlined in that last lecture to get to this average value. And I'm pointing it out because what we're going to look at is the, the Pareto segment. The 20% who are bringing 80% of all customer lifetime value, it's not $486 for them. It's significantly higher. It's $3,500. So, but just some average median customer, it's about a $500 lifetime value. We identified through that past analysis this Pareto persona. The 20% of customers who are producing, within the ticketing data, 80% of all customer lifetime value. There is a lecture on YouTube and SlideShare called 80% of your marketing is wasted that we did. And it, the first part of it talks in detail about the Pareto principle and how this shows up in nature, how this shows up. It was an economist who pointed this out. It shows up in AdWord clicks. 20% of your AdWord campaigns are going to produce 80% of your clicks. It's going to show up in conversions. 80% of your conversions are going to come from 20% of your customers that you're putting through the funnel. Or the value of those conversions. Or 20% of the ads that you run will result in 80% of the conversions that you get. It's going to show up over and over and over. We look for it on every single data set we've ever been given, and so far I don't think we've ever not found it. It's just part of distributional patterns given things like probability. And so knowing that, and this gets to the question that Joseph asked about how we segment, we didn't do, there are lots of different segmenting methods. Uh, I'm having a hard time just because of where the screen is reading what it says. I can't quite make out what it says, Joseph, so maybe you message me later and I can answer. Um, I will tell you that there are many different ways of, of segmenting. I mean, you can just say male, female, and you've segmented your customers. You can just say top 20% of revenue, and you've segmented your customers. You can also do behavioral choice survey questions and use dimension reduction and actual clustering algorithms, hierarchical and non-hierarchical, and you could create math-based personas. And that is an extremely powerful way. That's a Google level getting to know somebody kind of approach. You really get to know that, them as individuals, and then you can segment them that way and build personas that way. You get to pick the persona just like you get to pick the clustering method, and one of the critiques, one of the statistical critiques of clustering is there's no p-value, there's no real anything that says that Eric did it right that way, and that you can use distance, you can use some mathematical processes, it's not a black box, but there's nothing at the end of it that says this is necessarily right. And often when we'll run those deeper um, behavioral economic type segmentations, we will use multiple 
segmenting approaches. We'll do different numbers of segments. We'll do different, and then we'll create what we think are two really viable options, and then we'll bring that to the client and say, which of these actually makes more sense? And every single time, they immediately are like, this one. I know that persona. I know that person that you're describing with these characteristics. Like, I've interacted with that kind of person at these events. And then you say, great. So you then use that and you go forward with the analysis. The Pareto persona specifically is just the top 20%. It's just the top quintile. So this is really easy. You don't have to do any of that deep clustering or any sort of other persona development. It's still math-based. You're still saying we're going to organize people by their customer lifetime value, and then we're going to just take the top 20% and we're going to go look at how they differ from everybody else. So this is the festival's persona. Her name's Paula. She's female over the age of 65, and she has a master's degree. In fact, she's very highly educated. Her median household income, not just the personal income, her household income, is $125,000. She's been attending for more than 20 years, and her customer lifetime value is $3,500. She usually attends in August. This puts a face on everything about, if you just keep saying the Pareto persona the rest of the way through your results, you're going to lose people. But instead you say, we're going to talk about Paula. They'll remember Paula. That picture will stick with them. They might run into Paula, the character actor in public. You're like, I know you. It's a real person who has these characteristics on average. So there are Paulas out there who actually have PhDs. That was a slightly smaller group than the master's degree. There are also Paulas out there who have uh, bachelor's degrees. Because the thing that actually defined Paula ultimately was top 20% of revenue. There are Pauls out there who are also 65 years of age and have master's degrees and have a high household income and have been coming for 20 years. But two out of the three of them are going to be a Paula, and one out of the three will be a Paul. So we're giving the most predictive descriptions of that Pareto persona so that it is anchored in people's minds. This is who we're targeting with the marketing that we're going to change based on what we know about this high value group, which they are high value. $3,500 is quite a bit higher than 485. And depending again on how you trim some outliers or look at maybe things like log value instead of level value, Paula is about worth 10 times as much as any other customer. So that's the persona that we're going to use, okay? With that persona, we then said, let's go build a predictive model to understand just the customer lifetime value of this top 20% of Paula. This is some of the model, not all of it. I. I think it's okay to flash something like this and say, look at my coding skills, the colors are great, and move on. This is, this is in here to show you that there is a predictive model. We said we would build one. We did. Here it is. If this is what you actually showed everybody, I don't think you're going to be very successful. If instead you say, look, we, we found Paula, contrast this visual of we found Paula, here she is, to this visual of this is what it tells us about Paula, to instead of stopping here, which is where a lot of analysts stop, and instead translating it into another framework, now we're going to invoke the customer journey and we're going to talk about Paula. What were the variables from our predictive model that related to awareness that were important, that we could use? Well, one of them was the channel, that Paula becomes aware of both the festival and the schedule. They're primarily digital. Email, website, Facebook, brochures are in there. The, this organization does all kinds of traditional print, radio, television. But if you want to reach Paula, email is the best. The website's the next best because she's also using it to find out the schedule, which means if you start to set up a funnel, and we'll talk about that, on the schedule on the website, you can funnel Paula into a higher purchase, possibly, or into more purchase and see if you can drive her customer lifetime value. And you'll be able to measure it. 
and test it and validate it, which is going to be kind of hard with brochures. And it's going to be really hard with uh, banners, billboards, radio, television. This is how Paula becomes aware of the festival. This information is directly useful for the, for the how are we going to use this insight. Well, mark it on website. Treat the website more like a marketing tool. Maybe up your marketing game through the emails and start pushing on Facebook because Paula does remember seeing ads there. What about the purchase stage in the customer journey? And this is also a, re a reduced form of the customer journey. You have awareness, then conversion, then purchase. We're skipping conversion because we already have this data on the purchase and because this has to fit within, how much time do we have left? Only a few more minutes. Um, we do have data on that. So if someone said, well, what about consideration? There's actually quite a bit of survey data on the competitors. But we're going to move from awareness now to purchase. Paula typically buys eight tickets per visit instead of the four that the regular customer would do. And as I pointed out, her customer lifetime value is 3,500, which is about 10 times higher. In addition to festival tickets, she also buys other things like backstage tours. This is great for recommender engine kind of stuff. And she donates. Because this festival is a nonprofit, she donates $100 to the festival regularly which is something that adds to her customer lifetime value. It's not actually in the ticket sales. What about getting more Paula's, the growth part of the journey? Well, Paula is 99% likely to attend next year. So her present discounted value of ticket sales is about $392. That would be added to her existing ticket sales. So you see, we're starting to climb. We've added $100 for a donation. We've added $400 for the likelihood that she'll come next year. We already know that she has a base of $3,500. We're almost to $4,000. And I think one of the most important non-monetary pieces that you can add, and this is great with the customer journey because a lot of organizations are doing customer experience research. This is a big part of what Qualtrics is built on, is likelihood to recommend. And we looked at detail in Net Promoter Score last time. Paula's Net Promoter Score is 90%. 90% of Paula's out there are telling other people, you got to go to this festival, it's so great. How much does that add to her customer lifetime value? If we actually did a test through email, we could validate and put a hard number on that. But for now, we just have to say it's a non-monetary ad. Let's assume that she gets one other Paula with all of her efforts. Or let's, and then discount that 50%. That's another $200. We've clearly passed the $4,000 threshold on on Paula's lifetime value. So we looked at that persona, we built a predictive model, we put the results into the framework of three pieces of the customer journey, and here are the clear actionable recommendations from all that descriptive analytical work that was done, from all of that uh, data prepping, the surveying, here's what we can say to answer the question about increasing customer lifetime value. Offer a discount on two additional tickets, when Paula purchases eight. You know that she's on average going to be purchasing eight. If you can incentivize half of those people to purchase a little bit more through a discount, that's one way to increase customer lifetime value. Another is to incentivize her to recommend in exchange for a free backstage tour. The marginal cost of a backstage tour is almost zero. It happens anyways. Offering that to her in a way to encourage recommendation, puts her under the principle of, uh, oh, Costco uses it, what is, what is it called? The Costco snacks, right? That's why Costco does this. You feel indebted when they give you a cracker to go buy crackers, because you're a decent human being, and when people give you something, you feel kind of indebted to them. Incentivize her to recommend, and that will bring other people in more customer value. And ask for a second donation of $100 a year. Some of the Paulas are donating up to $500 a year. Just ask for additional donations or convert that. That's about a $10. If you could take that $100 donation and say instead, 
let's turn it into 12 $10 payments. You've actually made $120 instead of $100. But we have no data on that. I'm just telling you that that's a potential option and something we could go talk to a few Paulas about and see if they would do. What about if that answers how to increase, profitably increase our customer lifetime value, what about the marketing uses for it? How do we now take this information and go use it? Well, Facebook targeted ads based on her demographics will probably perform very well, especially if they're driving to the website where you could create and optimize an online sales funnel because people are already coming there. Paula's already coming there to get the schedule. Email campaigns, social media, anything that drives the website can also be then tracked and that funnel can be optimized to increase sales. As far as the timing, emailing her in June and July to maximize the likelihood of an August attendance. Yes, she's 99% likely to attend. That other 1% could be, there's just nothing that can be done. Family things happen, other needs happen. Could also be that as much as she loves the festival, she forgot that year and it was too late and it was sold out. So getting out ahead of her, knowing that she's going to be coming in August, giving her time to buy tickets in advance would likely maximize the likelihood of her attendance. Three clear points about how to increase customer lifetime value profitably. Three clear points on how to target the marketing based on this information. Built on six slides that had almost no data visuals. They had numbers. They were the result of a lot of analytics. They were the result of all kinds of charts and visuals and descriptive tables and then having to cut people out and change the, des the description because of outliers. There was an immense amount of work to get to three very simple bullet point lines. And those lines will allow people to act on it far more quickly and more accurately than all the tables and charts that we could have dumped on them. And that is, that is what takes analytics and moves them into actionable insights. Next month, we're going to calculate the customer lifetime value. This was a, we've actually had quite a bit of request about this. Um, it was pretty simplistic in the case of this festival because they already had a ticket system and they really only sold a couple things. But a lot of businesses have multiple products. How do you deal with that? Then you have you know, repeat purchases and what's the frequency of those repeat purchases. And then you have upsells, other things. And then you have to discount. You know, if you know they're going to be around for a decade because of contracting. What's the discounted value of those things? Again, what's the non-monetary non value of things like recommendations? All of that can be used through, can be found through observational or survey data to then be used to calculate a very hard number that you can get on average first and then go down to the individual level and then start to segment, whether you do it through a Pareto method or some other approach. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. I'll hang around here to answer any questions anybody has. You, at this point, can just ask them either in the room or you can unmute yourself and ask them to me directly. If we don't have any questions in the next minute, though, then I will see you next month. Do you want to meet this list for this question? Let's see. Joseph, you're going to have to explain your question to me, please. Joseph still there? He says he's on. Yeah, sorry, Luciano. I no actually problem. was just on the phone with Johnny. Okay. Okay. So um, it looks like we're we're gonna. Be, anyway, are there other people still on? Yes, there are. I, <laughs> all right. I'll. I I just barely put my headphones. Back and it's on, be, so and it's being recorded and it's being broadcast live on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So you're talking about geo-based demographic segments? So with Claritas Prism segments, that's actually um, like more personas. So for example, if you're like the young Digerati, 
would be one thing. Uh, Nelson purchased Claritas a number of years ago. Um, and it would be like, if you, if you belong to a certain segment, then you're uh, a certain like urban classification, uh, a certain wealth classification, and they combine, you know, different profile data. They have to have a certain amount of information on you to profile you a certain way. But if you belong to say young Gujarati or like up and comers or whatever it might be, you might have a propensity uh, in your purchasing behavior towards certain items. And so, you know, if I, uh, for example, create area rugs, I can kind of determine who's more likely to index higher on area rug purchases. Um, and then it corresponds with other information, like I might be more likely to drive a Volkswagen and eat a Panera Bread, and someone else might be more likely to drive, uh, you know, a, a Dodge and eat at, uh, you know, uh, Wendy's or whatever. Yeah, so those are predetermined segments, correct? Yeah. But they are based on their years of research. I mean, Nielsen is a big company, so they're probably pulling in all kinds of uh, TV data, and they probably got a lot of the data about your last five purchases. These, there are a couple of these really big data aggregators. So Experian is one. It's one of the reasons that they were hacked is they have so much data that they've put together on your behavior. And none of it matches what Google has, by the way. None of it. But they're trying. And the difference, I mean, Google will sell you access to people. You can find Paula on Google, you know, potentially as easily as you could find Paula on Facebook. It's just that we know that Paula's on Facebook. But Google knows a lot about people individually. They're one person you can buy from for, but you buy advertising directly with them. You're talking about buying lists though, right? Because these companies, usually what they'll do is they'll sell you, oh, you're looking for this segment, so we'll get you in touch with them, or this person is like that personality, so we're going to infer all these other things about them. And I think that those predetermined solutions are pretty good. Definitely a place to start if you don't have the ability to do any, if you don't have any internal data, like if you're about to do a new product, I think that kind of data is great. I think if you have a commodity in the market and you're trying to track the national patterns, that kind of data is great. If you want to know how to email somebody that you've had in your newsletter list for 20 years, right, they're still using an AOL.com email address maybe, um, I think that you have to do some primary research and collect your own observational data on them. I think that it's just a matter of how personal you want to get. I think the promise of these big companies is you'll get to know somebody on a personal level and you'll be able to be personal with them. And then if you're a stranger and you walk up to somebody in public, I actually do this to my students the first day of class. So I will memorize, I have my TA go do background research on all of them because we do background research here on any focus group or IDI people that we use. And so I have that same team. Hey, here's 30 people. Go look them up. Find everything you can online. And I'll walk in with personal details on people. Like I knew somebody's, this year I knew somebody's high school jersey number. And it scares the hell out of them. And I think that's the danger with those non, they're not really personal. You know details about them, but they don't know you. And they might not have given them to you with any sort of permission. You're getting them from some purchase list. And... It's a very tight line to walk with them to not creep them out. That's not true with someone who's opted into your newsletter or is in your HubSpot or that you've had a long-standing business relationship with. Those people and the people that you'd like to grow who are similar to them do know a lot about you and you know a lot about them. They've shared a lot of information with you voluntarily even if they haven't known it the whole time. And if you, if you don't creep them out as well, they will very much appreciate personalized experiences. People want these experiences. They just want to want them. They don't want them to be pushed on them. And I think that that's the biggest thing about predetermined segments. But speed is a trade-off you have to make against accuracy. Price and costs are a trade-off you have to make against speed and accuracy. If, you, if it gets you something fast that's usable and you can test it and validate it, then use it until it's not working anymore. And then redo your personas. These are living things. It's not like Paula 
in fact, this festival, one of their problems is they're not attracting donors who are under 65. And so they're very worried what happens when the boomer generation goes. Their whole market shifts because millennials don't really come to this festival. Gen Xers don't really come to this festival. So that persona is not going to work forever. Hopefully that answered your question, Joseph. For sure. Anybody else? Kathy, Jacob, Eric, Tom? Yeah, so this gets back to, well, why did we pick the top 20%? Just because they're there. Can we actually get more value out of them, or would it have been better to grab the, uh, the next quintile down and try to drive them up? I, that, that's cohort analysis, and I think you should be doing everything simultaneously. So that was a value judgment that we, I made as an analyst, and really it was just because of the, to try to keep continuity in the example. But um, absolutely, it's, the one that I think is the easiest to do that with is actually net promoter score. So everybody pays attention to the promoters and the detractors, and they just throw out the, the neutrals. And yet, if you actually look at things, like you do some deeper modeling around satisfaction and likelihood to return, and then it's connection to likelihood to recommend, those neutrals are often the easier ones to convert, to upsell and convert, to turn into a promoter. And it just comes down to, again, what's the speed, what's the priority, what's the cost? It's, it's pretty easy, it's pretty cheap to email Paula and say, Paula, we wanna give you a free backstage pass. If you forward this email on to one of your friends and that person buys tickets with this link, we'll give it to you. And you can validate that that actually worked. So that's the other part is you have to trade off the how easy is it to go do whatever it is you're recommending. But yeah, net promoters are ones that I think in particular, and there were other stuff, by the way, that came out of this data that was kind of surprising. So for example, some of these emails came from their their uh, newsletter. And we actually got a higher response rate, a higher completion rate out of people who had unsubscribed from the newsletter than people who were currently subscribed. There were a lot of Paulas who get emails but they unsubscribe from the newsletter. And it's not because they don't like the festival. It's not because they don't want to come and they won't spend money. It's because they just don't like the newsletter. And so making that assumption that anybody who's unsubscribed is lost or doesn't like us, that's probably a bad assumption. We only discovered that through research. Any other questions? All right. I will make sure that this video gets posted to YouTube. Uh, the slides to slide share. There will be an email sent around that has a link to all of this. Um, and for those who can join, we'll see you next month.